Okay, welcome back. Here we are. We're going to cover lighting, lighting and environment nodes. And uh, we have our uh, regular structure, although we split it out a little bit. Uh, instead of putting all the concepts first and then all the nodes, I split it out to first cover the lighting concepts and lighting nodes, and then we'll do the environment concepts and environment nodes. And so here's our overview of what we're covering. Uh, we have some basic concepts of lighting, and which, which is very interesting since we've been using lighting since the very first lesson. And now uh, we're going to see just how it works. It's sort of like in grade school when you discover you've been talking in sentences all your life and never knew it. We're, we're going to get to the bottom of what lighting is about. And then uh, we'll look over the basic lights uh, that we use, uh, directional light, point light, spotlight, but uh, also a less recognized light, which is the headlight, which has been our workhorse up till now. Uh, uh, anywhere you go, we typically have a light pointing where we're looking. Then we'll cover uh, our environment nodes, which in this case are the two background nodes and fog. We'll see in a later chapter that there are also environmental sensors. So those are different. We are looking at uh, background and fog. Okay, so first, lighting. And um, if we consider what we've studied so far in this course and the different ways of viewing things, we've primarily been preoccupied with the notion of constructing the geometry getting it the right shape, the right color, texture, what have you, positioning it and orienting it where each piece and part should be in the real world. And then we've looked at where does the camera go? Where is our viewpoint? How can we navigate that viewpoint relative to objects to see what we want? Well, as it turns out, that's really only uh, two out of three pieces that are needed to properly render things in 3D. And, and just like the real world where we have objects that can be seen and you're able to look at them, unless you have a lighting source to illuminate the uh, materials, then there's nothing to see. Everything is black. So because the design of 3D graphics is trying to emulate actual optical properties, optical physics, at least to a, a plausible first approximation, we do have lights impinging on objects which we can then view as, as our basic model. So uh, uh, this is why lighting is so important. We've been able to fake it up till now in that we've just used a very simple light, the headlight that's sort of built in and not have to worry about it. But now that we want to improve the realism of our scenes, we're going to see how to do that by including lights. Okay, now it turns out that this is all mathematical. This is all computational. There are equations of lighting that are used that govern how do we draw different materials based on the color, the aspect angle, the reflection of that light source back to the viewer. And there are uh, a number of factors, some major, some minor, you can see most of them just when you look at material node and some of the field properties in there. But uh, we do um, want to uh, figure that out. So the way we do that is uh, by getting to deliver about our lights and then seeing what the factors are. So if you say, well, more light means more bright, more pixels, we can see more. Uh, we can see that uh, the light source, we will see that the light source really has a lot to do with it. So if the shape is the, uh, uh, includes the geometry, then we do have the things that we've built, we do have the viewpoint, and now we do have light sources as the three parts of how do we get these things. And so therefore lighting is our third component. 
All right, so here's a picture to illustrate that set of arrangements. <coughs> and uh, very simply drawn, you could think of the uh, straight line right here as the cutting plane for what the viewpoint sees. And if we took a cross section of that, that would be a rectangle that matches the uh, square, typically square or rectangular uh, viewport of your display. And uh, you could also think of that as, say, uh, given that the camera, the eye point, and and that cutting plane is a perpendicular, you can think of that as a slice of what's already drawn. Inside there. So you can think of the view frustrum as being pyramidal in shape and your viewpoint screen, what gets drawn on your computer screen is just a slice of what you're looking at out into that scene. Okay. Now, what do we care about when we do this? Well, uh, historically at least, what we've cared quite a lot about is not just is it correctly set up, is it properly defined, but is it fast enough? Is it able to run at a real-time frame rate so that it can truly be considered interactive? Because if, it's, if it ain't moving, it ain't 3D. You want things to be able to move not just herky-jerky a step at a time, but smoothly right across so that we can uh, get that sense of immersion, that sense of presence, the belief that we are working in a 3D space, even though we might just have 2D interface devices and a 2D screen that we're considering. So how fast is fast enough? Well. Uh, the human perception of smooth motion uh, occurs around seven to eight frames per second. It depends on people, it depends on the uh, content you're looking at. You can tell if it's slower than that. Above that, it's uh, much harder to tell unless you really pay attention. So a good rule of thumb is 10 or even 15 frames per second is the goal that you want. Where each frame, of course, being the picture and the refresh rate that it's that it's drawing. Now it used to be that much of the work we did in 3D, at least much of the programming effort, modeling effort that we took, was all organized on maximizing that frame rate because computer graphics was considered computationally expensive. Uh, we'd, we'd often spend tens of thousands of, of dollars on graphics workstations that could handle that load. Well, with the uh, exponentially steadily improving quality of our uh, graphics cards and our graphics processing units and uh, all of the hardware used to draw 3D, which uh, frankly has been even faster than Moore's Law, double even, doubling even more, uh, more quickly than uh, uh, a factor of uh, Every, every year and a half doubling in price performance, we've been actually uh, beating that rate for some time, uh, what Moore's Law talks about. Uh, it turns out that getting 10 to 15 frames per second is a heck of a lot easier than it used to be. And as a result, this course and a lot of 3D doesn't have to spend nearly as much time talking about performance. That's the good news. Nevertheless, uh, lighting can have a significant impact on performance, and, and we'll see how much. And so uh, that's why we're paying attention to it now. In fact, if you, can, if you consider from the previous picture that uh, this process of looking at what light sources are computed, and if we say, that each one of those, how many of those are there? Well, there are as many as there are 
pixels on the screen. And again, that screen is right over here, that cross section of it. So if we say, well, that's how many pixels we have to draw that are coming back to the viewpoint. Well, if we ask, what is the contribution of a light to that process? Well, let's, let's draw one. Let's put a spotlight right there and start drawing pixels. And so we want to get an equal angle of incidence and reflection for each point. Excuse me, that was a little bit off. Okay, so we can see that for uh, even just a spotlight, that as many pixels as we have, when we add a light, that effectively doubles our computational load. If we add a, th a third light, we'll have a tripling of our original computational load. So if you ask how big a contribution are lights anyway to performance, to the cost of computing these sophisticated pictures, well, the answer is it's as expensive as anything else. It's apparently the most expensive thing because whatever <coughs> you have in here, however complicated or uh, sophisticated your object might be, double it, triple it, quadruple it, whatever it takes with each and every light. So there's a linear relationship there and that's a lot. Okay, so the takeaway then is if we want to be still performant, still rendering quickly, even with fast graphics cards, then we better pay attention to our lights and be careful not to overuse them. And um, even if you're not worried about, well, my scene's not that big a deal, it looks fine, and looking better is okay, you still have to think about, well, the more we do, the more we want to do. We're building larger and larger and larger scenes. So if you start getting lots of inlines, which are in turn inlining other things to build up a town or a city or a very large virtual space, then at some point you do have to consider how, how many lights do I have in there and how do I know which one's active and how am I controlling the lighting in the scene. Okay, so uh, how is the math done? Well. There are definitely uh, certain approximations in quality, in the phenomenology, the physics of optical properties. There is, uh, despite the apparent complexity of computer graphics, when you start digging in and looking at those uh, uh, equations and how they're implemented in the code, it's quite sophisticated. But I, I think it's also humbling to take a look uh, in the bookstore. Next time you're in the college bookstore, try to find the, the biggest book on computer graphics and then find the biggest book on optics. And usually when I do that, I find, well, the, you have a nice big fat book on computer graphics and then another nice big fat book on optics. And you go, well, that looks comparable until you, you check the spine of the optics book and it says, Volume one of two, three, four volumes. It just goes on and on. So, absolutely, graphics is a, uh, there are a number of approximations there. Nevertheless, our goal is to achieve verisimilitude, to make it look cool, to make it look real, and uh, to be good enough. So, how we do that is often part of the art of how we put the computer graphics together. Meanwhile, it's also a rich source of research. There are a lot of uh, interesting uh, research efforts going on to continually improve uh, graphics fidelity. The best place to look at that, uh, if you are interested, is of course in the uh, SIGGRAPH community.
The reason why we haven't gone all the way with all the optics everywhere is because it's still out of reach, much of that from, uh, from the capacity of ordinary computers. In fact, when movies are, that have a heavy computer graphics component are being rendered, often they'll intentionally render them at a very low fidelity form so that the movie artists, the CGI, computer graphic, interactive entertainment artists, can get a quick response to see how the blocked out, simplistic look of their digital actors appears and how they interact. And it's only after that they've choreographed and staged and put a lot of this stuff together that they say, okay, time to go home. We'll let the cluster crunch frames overnight. Definitely rendering at lower than real time, but in higher fidelity. So then in the morning we can look at a movie playback of what that high fidelity appearance looks like. Okay, so why do we make these approximations interactive? and real time, because if it's not moving, maybe it's just a movie. Uh, so, here we are. Now, what other techniques are possible? Uh, if you do study in uh, SIGGRAPH or in other books or in other places, then uh, ray tracing has been around for quite a long time. Volumetric rendering is looking less at the optical aspects per se and more at the internal structure of objects. Thus it's going through a volume by slices or ISO surfaces, common valued surfaces in there, or uh, some other way of teasing out the data of interest from a huge block of essentially continuous, uh, at least continuously sampled data. Uh, light fields is another uh, important recent innovation in the last few years. But even so, even if you look at all of those things, there are certain characteristics, certain techniques that uh, hold true throughout Interactive 3D. And those are the lighting equations and rendering techniques that X3D has uh, paid, attention, paid attention to. At the same time, if you use those more advanced techniques, often you can, depending on the technique and depending on the scene, you can take those results and export them to X3D. And they may still be quite movable then, but uh, if a complex uh, uh, lighting situation has translated itself into carefully uh, defined material values, color values, transparency values, for a, a sophisticated set of geometry, then great. If we can map it into the X3D nodes, then it will definitely perform in, in a highly performant way, so uh, a fast way. So thus, it, it looks like X3D is a good match, and uh, because the X is extensible, we continue to grow X3D to add new techniques as they become available, as they become essentially stable across different platforms so that if we provide them to authors, they can't be used in a consistent way uh, that stands the test of time. Okay, and to get that sense of balance uh, is not a new challenge. Actually, that's always been the challenge uh, in 3D graphics, and you see uh, essentially a mix of, uh, in the community of people who are primarily fo focused on the technology, the math, the software, the hardware, how do we get this stuff to work, as opposed to the more artistic folks who are looking at, does it look right? Is it doing the things I want? How do I make it look better? How do I achieve the goals? How do I produce an effect in the viewer that tells the story or makes the impression I want to achieve? So it's both left brain and right brain, if you will. And you see this uh, not just in the literature, but definitely at the conferences. Uh, SIGGRAPH community certainly has its share of geeks compared to many computer science uh, disciplines. And, and you can get as geeky and as technoidal as you want. Uh, what's that? They have more than their share? Uh, but they also have their share of artists. And, uh, and uh, dare I say it, uh, women. Uh, who, who attend these conferences. Uh, so uh, it does take all kinds and, and you find that the graphics community is really diverse uh, 
really rich, really pay, plays, really places a lot of attention, a high premium on collaboration and working together across disciplines. Yeah, okay. yeah. What was it, the quote, the melting of math and math and art, I think was the... The melting of math and art. It was a big and, uh, this is, yeah, that's a good, good way to put it. Okay, so as an author, uh, good news. You get to do both. You get to think about both. We not only want to take advantage of the technology in a competent, adept way, but we want to tell a story. We want to get across a point. We want the uh, artistry of the 3D to help us communicate what that interaction, what that functionality is really supposed to mean to an end user. Okay, so enough of that uh, uh, fun artistic stuff for a little bit here. Let's get back to the technology because this course is primarily focused on how do we make it work and what are the tools at your disposal. So if we look at the lighting nodes covered in this chapter, there are some common fields <coughs> through each of them. So first we have ambient intensity. Okay, so ambient intensity is interesting because that's considered the basic light that's in a scene whether or not the uh, direct light is shining on it. And in most rooms, we have this kind of light. Now let's do a little experiment. Uh, uh, Jeff, I'm hoping that you can turn on a light in the back room and open the door, and then we'll, we'll uh, turn off the uh, big light. Okay. okay, in fact, first let's, let's just turn off the top light in this room before you open the door, and let's see what that looks like. Okay, here we go. Gee, almost nothing. Uh, I'm getting some light from my computer monitor and from the display, and now basically nothing. Okay, let's uh, let's restore and and this time let's take it, put the light on and then could you please open the door, turn on a backlight in the other room, and see what kind of ambient light contribution we might have in here. Is there? Uh, I guess the backlight's on already. Not too much. So this is a fairly dark room. As you can see, if I put this off, see if we have any room at all. Not so much. Jeff, could you swing the camera around and take a look at the door and its vicinity? Okay, so here we go. And as, as we do this, you'll see that sure enough, from the light streaming in, from outside the room, against the different walls, against the plant. It's, it's uh, uh, not in the door itself, but around the door. As we get farther and farther away from that source of light, it becomes harder to tell where the light's coming from. How about the fuse box here, Jeff? Can you, can you get that in right directly behind you? Uh, yeah, it just keeps not so fast when you're swinging, but bring it around to the different different walls over there. That's good right there. If you look at that location, you can see that, sure, it's lit, but it's hard to tell where it's lit from. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so uh, go ahead and try that yourself where you're at. Uh, turn off the top light, let other ambient sources of light uh, illuminate the room. And you'll see as you look around, it's often pretty hard to tell where the light source is coming from. Uh, even in a case like this room where it's dark without the top lights, because there are a number of top lights in the room, it can be seen that, well, I'm getting a strong light component from the front here, but there's also light behind. Like if I look at the back of my hand, it's lit. There's a certain basic uh, coloring there. You can see behind me on the walls and uh, well no you can't because there's a green screen. <laughs> but if you look around you can tell what's going on and this is what we're trying to capture in, in this field here. Ambient intensity. Okay. So uh, the other benefit of this field is that if we keep a small value in there then even if 
all the lights get turned off because that factor is reflecting uh, what ambient omnidirectional light might be present we can see what's there. Okay, so unlike this room where if you turn off the lights uh, it goes pitch black, if you keep ambient intensity on most of your materials then if you turn off all the lights you'll still be able to see uh, some uh, uh, simply lit shapes. Okay, so next up. Uh, common field among all the nodes is intensity and uh, that's the basic uh, strength of each light, it's used in the lighting equations to multiply as a factor against all the other factors to make the color brighter or darker. Now, uh, ambient intensity and intensity both range a value from 0 to 1 as uh, what are legal values for those. Then uh, color we're quite familiar with from seeing it in material. RGB value, uh, no transparency here because it's the color that's being emitted of the light and so you can think of that as the strength of the red, green, and blue components as they multiply against other things. So actually you can see that color and intensity are closely related because Color and intensity are closely related because uh, you can reduce the color values uniformly by a, a constant factor or you can change the intensity factor and it will have the same result in what is shown. Okay, now we have a table that shows the common color values both in red, green, blue and in uh, HTML if we were to use the uh, uh, double hex values that are in there. So you can see the red, green, blue here is uh, for green 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0.5, 0. We have 0, 0 hex, 0, excuse me, uh, 8, 0 hex, and 0, 0 hex or how that breaks out and we saw earlier how to convert that but there's our RGB in base 10 on a scale of 1 to 0 uh, 0 to 1, 1 1.0 what it turns out to be. Okay so that table is just provided as a convenience if you're looking for different light factors. You want to be a little careful when you uh, use light factors or, or uh, different colored lights besides white because it can make your materials look quite different. Okay, so where are we? We've gotten a good start here now on lighting concepts and we'll finish with a couple more fields, a couple more common fields next time and then uh, get right into the notes. See you then. Okay, so we're back and we're working on lighting and let's finish the rest of these common fields. We uh, took a quick look at ambient intensity and intensity which range from 0 to 1 and you know, let us control right at the light level the strength of the light contributions from the, uh, from the background scene and from the rest of the uh, uh, from the light itself and then we had uh, an RGB value which is also 0 to 1 for uh, each and of course there's no transparency associated with lights uh, because they are not rendered themselves. And we saw some example values here uh, just to get you started of course you can use the color editors in uh, X3D Edit as well. Often just swagging it works too where you say well I want mostly red and then a little green, a little white, what do I got here? Okay, next uh, common fields that we see across most of the lights, and that's uh, global. And global is very important. Uh, uh, the global helps scope the effect of the light, meaning contain how much of the scene graph that the light will be able to shine on. 
Okay, and the reason this is important is because as we inline more and more scenes, it would let you put lights in the sub-scenes so that they were properly lit if you had special illumination or special illustration requirements for those things. Yet, it wouldn't keep adding light after light after light, so you get a million lights turned on and it just won't work anymore. So, uh, uh, you want to keep a global false by default so that however high the light is in your scene, it just sh shines on those things. If you want to keep a light from shining on other parts of the scene, then you could uh, uh, scope it with a grouping node. So for example, uh, if we had a group here and then uh, we had a, uh, well let's say a directional light uh, shining and then uh, another shape and uh, perhaps a whole room well today. Let's try again. In line a room. This would let us put uh, a light just within that room and then uh, elsewhere in the scene graph let's see if we can get this right now. Okay so Elsewhere in the scene graph, then, we could have other stuff. And none of that work would, none of that stuff would get the light impacted on it. Okay, so this is how we segment and segregate lights within a scene. Pretty straightforward. Uh, on is uh, another field we get on most lights, which is uh, similar to enabled on a sensor field, but we simply use on or off because you turn lights on and off. Okay, it's still a Boolean, so the syntax would, for this would be on equals true would be our default and how we set that. Okay, what else do we have? Well. <clears throat> Lighting itself does have a few limitations, and uh, perhaps we should reiterate here. Uh, the first one would be that the light itself does not present visible geometry. Okay, you cannot directly see the light as a blob or a cone or anything else in the scene. All you can see is the effects of the light as other geometry gets in front of it and, and reflects light back to the user's viewpoint. Uh, another key thing about light is uh, because our computational efficiency is all defined for real-time performance, we don't do any kind of occlusion or uh, blocking checks to see, well, if there's a wall here, it blocks the light. No, the light will shine right through the wall and eliminate anything on the other side. And you go, well, what good is that? Why would we shine a light through the wall? Well, that's how it works. The light will shine on whatever's in scope. So if we take that same question and rephrase it as, how do I change the scope of my light so that it shines on one side of the wall and the object's there, but not on the other side? Answer, oh well we saw it on the previous picture I just drew for you, which is you use a grouping node and split those out. So that the one side of the wall and the viewpoint and the things you might see are on one side and your light is also on that side. And global stays false for that. And then if you go to the other side of the wall, that will still be visible and rendered, but only using the lights that are turned on on that side. Perhaps just the headlight in the nav info node perhaps another light that's in the scene. Okay, so uh, perhaps surprising sometimes, but uh, 
usually with a well-designed scene, it's not noticeable. Uh, we're going to see that, an example of this in just a moment. Next thing, lighting limitations uh, are uh, shadows. We don't yet have shadows built in. And this has been a long time on the wish list for features. And as it turns out, there are three or four uh, browsers that implement. In fact, uh, I think the first browser that did this was uh, a system called Open Worlds. Gosh, uh, in the early 2000s, maybe around 2002, where they did this. Uh, now several browsers support it as an extra feature. Nobody's quite agreed yet on the syntax for how we represent that in the scene. There are two schools of thought on this. One should be very simple and you're either turning it on or off, uh, perhaps in a scoped way. The other school of thought is, oh, this should be highly detailed so that, well, we can express this two ways, so that authors have a lot of control over it or it's really hard to get done right. So uh, your mileage may vary. This, this is what we're sorting out on the extra D list. We recently uh, rebroached this as a candidate node and a candidate topic. So stay tuned. Maybe version 3.3, the version we're currently working on, will see shadows. It's certainly technically feasible and reasonably stable now. So hopefully we can agree on the best way that will work across all sorts of software all sorts of platforms. Okay, what else? Well, uh, placing a light inside an object. Well, yeah, that can be tricky. Sometimes you want that if you're inside a room. Other times, uh, you don't want it. For example, if we use you know, our famous example of a brick where solid equals true, where you're not rendering on the inside, why would you put a light on the inside of the brick if it's not going to be viewed inside of there. So that would be one reason not to do it. Another reason this is difficult is the light is only reflected across faces that are facing it, meaning the normals are pointed out. So if we have, a, let's say, a wall and the light is coming through the wall, then the sides of the polygons on the far side of the wall, because they're pointing away from the light, they will not reflect any of that light. Okay, So you have to think this through sometimes. Usually that makes sense. You don't want to shine a light at something and illuminate the back side. But other times you just want to put a light in the scene and make everything visible and it's hard to put the, right, the light in the right place. It's, then you've got to say, well, I need multiple lights. How many do I need? You get a little sophisticated. So as long as we keep it straight, for uh, what is it that we want, I think we're, we're okay. But uh, about the only time we might use geometry uh, that surrounds a light itself is probably if you're using it to uh, illustrate the scene. And by that I mean, uh, let's try a different color this time. If we're intentionally showing the light location, if we have, say, a point light somewhere in the scene, then we might want to put a sphere around it with the uh, proper color so that when you look in the scene, you can see, oh, yeah, yeah, there's my light over there. Or maybe it's a, it's a cone uh, to have the same dimensions as a as a, uh, a spotlight, etc. Okay, so that's about the only time where you might put a light inside an object. Other limitations. Uh, this may change over time, uh, but most graphics hardware cards uh, can only handle so many lights because it's so fundamental to the rendering, fundamental to the construction of the of the geometry. So. Uh, if we uh, look at OpenGL specification, if we look at X3D specification, we'll see there's a limit of eight active lights at any given time. If you have more than eight lights in your scene, that's okay. It won't be an error, but uh, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Uh, there is no scheme for which light do we choose. So your results may be unpredictable 
and different in different browsers for which of the eight lights they might honor. Uh, if it's a software render, if it's a high fidelity uh, drawing system, it might render, use just as many as you want because it doesn't care about eight as an upper limit. <coughs> but we do have that upper limit to make sure that we can support real time interaction. Okay, so uh, that covers our concepts. Uh, short session today, sorry about that, but we're going to pick up tomorrow with uh, directional light and then we're going to go through each of the lights in there, directional light and the headlight on navigation info, point light and spotlight. See you then.